Okay, uh, so it's a pleasure for me to introduce Pavel Etingo from MIT. He's going to talk about incompressible symmetric tensor categories. Thank you, Pavel. Thank you very much. So it's my pleasure uh, to speak in this seminar. I, uh, I feel a little awkward when I get asked. I say, I say I'm supposed to give a talk today, and they ask me where, and then it's, I'm not sure <laughs> how to answer this question. But I suppose this talk is in Cordoba, right? <laughs> Okay, uh, so I've never actually been to the city of Cordoba, but I uh, now I'm giving a talk there. So <laughs> okay, so I'll speak about incompressible symmetric tensor categories, and uh, it's uh, joint work with Dave Benson and Victor Ostrich, and uh, it's contained in this paper here. Uh, the slides uh, were mostly written by Ostrick and then edited by me, so he actually used it for his talk about this paper. Um, so, uh, let me see. Uh, right, so, so let's uh, get started. Uh, so, uh, first of all, uh, let us recall some basics about representation categories of groups. So, I will always work over an algebraically closed field K. And, uh, if I have a finite group G, uh, we can form the category of finite dimensional representations of G. Uh, well, the collection of all finite dimensional representations, which we later see, forms a nice category. And uh, so what kind of mathematical object is that? Well, it's an abelian category, first of all. Now it has a tensor product uh, bifunctor. So you can tensor two representations. Uh, and this tensor product is associative and commutative. But because we're in categories, these are actually structures. You have to provide associativity and commutativity isomorphisms to say so. And they are supposed to satisfy some conditions, such as pentagon and hexagon relations. And uh, 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 we also have uh, the unit object one, or the trivial representation, and the duality operation when we attach to a representation, the dual representations. But for a category, uh, these are actually properties, unlike the previous thing, uh, which means that they actually, if they exist, they are unique. And they do exist in the case of representation category. And finally, uh, we have a forgetful functor, which uh, attaches to a representation, the underlying vector space. So uh, this rep G, uh, is a rigid symmetric tensor category. So rigid means that it has duals and it's equipped with a symmetric tensor functor to vector spaces. So it's an exact uh, functor uh, which preserves tensor product and preserves the symmetry. Uh, now uh, let's recall uh, Tanakian theory, which is uh, a theory that allows you to reconstruct the group G from this category. So uh, uh, by pre-Tanakian category, we will mean uh, a category of the kind as that we had before, but this is not necessarily having a functor to vector spaces. So a pre-Tanakian category is a k-linear, rigid, symmetric uh, tensor category, which uh, is, first of all, abelian. Uh, uh, home spaces are finite dimensional. Uh, objects have finite length. And uh, the unit is simple. So uh, when we say it's a tensor category, we always assume the compatibility of tensor products and abelian category structure, which means, or k-linear category structure, which means that uh, tensoring of morphisms is a bilinear map. And uh, by fiber functor on such a category, uh, we mean an exact symmetric uh, monoidal functor uh, from this category to vector spaces. And uh, if uh, a category has such a functor, uh, then uh, it is uh, called Tanakian, not just pre-Tanakian. Uh, so uh, by the way, it is known that when such a functor exists, it is unique. And there is a theorem that, uh, mm, you know, the idea of which goes back to Grothendieck, uh, uh, and uh, then uh, was developed by Saavedra Rivana in the, in the final form it appears in the Lean and Milne paper, uh, which says that uh, uh, 
uh, if C is Tanakian, then uh, C is a representation category of G uh, for some group G, not necessarily finite group, but uh, more generally an affine group scheme. Uh, an affine group scheme is just a spectrum of a commutative Hopf algebra. And uh, this G is uniquely determined, uh, namely it is the group of tensor automorphisms of L. But such a thing, uh, uh, so it's not just the group, the actual group of uh, tensor automorphisms, but it is the corresponding scheme. So you, you can define its points over any commutative ring. Uh, or, or over any, sorry, K, over any K algebra. So we work over some field K, so we can define points of this uh, uh, over any K algebra. So this is an affine group scheme over K. Uh, so uh, now the question is, uh, are there any uh, pre-Tanakian categories that aren't Tanakian? And of course, uh, uh, example of that is well known, and it is the category of super vector spaces. Uh, so uh, that, is, that category is defined when uh, characteristic of the ground field K is not equal to. So what is that category? Well, you can say that it is the same as representations of Z mod two, but uh, uh, the commutativity constraint, so everything is the same, except for uh, the flip map, the commutativity constraint which says, sends, uh, the ordinary flip map sends u tensor b uh, to b tensor u. But in this case, uh, there is a, a sign. Uh, so uh, representation of z mod two is uh, the same thing as a z mod two graded vector space. So there is an even part b zero and an odd part v one. And uh, this uh, uh, degree of u is, zero if vector is even and one if vector is odd. And uh, u tensor v goes to minus one to the degree of u, degree of v, v tensor u for homogeneous vectors u and v. So basically, if you have homogeneous vectors, then it is the same as in the usual case, except when both vectors are odd. And in that case, we have to put a minus one. So this category isn't Tanakian, it cannot be obtained as representation category of uh, uh, any affine group scheme, and it does not admit a uh, uh, forgetful functor to vector spaces. Well, more precisely, it does, but this functor is not symmetric because of this sign. And there is no functor that is symmetric. And uh, so, uh, so therefore, uh, uh, perhaps we should allow uh, uh, a generalization of the notion of Tanakian category, which is a super Tanakian category. So uh, we say uh, that a super fiber functor on a category C is an exact symmetric tensor functor to the category of super vector spaces. And uh, C is super Tanakian if it is pre Tanakian and admits such a super fiber functor. And uh, again, it is known that when such a super fiber functor exists, it is unique. Also, I should say that for characteristic two, we don't have this. So there is uh, no new notion and we just have ordinary vector spaces. Uh, and uh, so what is an example of such a category? Well, uh, uh, we uh, uh, can take an affine supergroup scheme, which is the spectrum where it basically means that we take Super commutative Hopf super algebra, and uh, look at representation category of G, which is the co module category of or such super algebra. And then this uh, thing with an appropriate uh, commutativity map uh, like this is a uh, super Tanakian. It has a forgetful functor to super vector spaces, which just forgets the structure of representation. Uh, um, so, so there is a question. question. Yeah. I, I have I, a question. Uh, Can I yeah. interrupt? Or? Uh, I was wondering if this notion of uh, super Tanakian has any relation with super tensor categories, that is, uh, tensor categories enriched in the super vector space. Yes, yes, yes. It, it does have, uh, uh, so it is uh, uh, connected to those. Uh, uh, but, uh, so, well, I mean, 
maybe I should say that uh, the notion of uh, super tensor category, which is a category enriched over super vector spaces, can be uh, such a category can be expressed in terms of ordinary. I, I mean, there is a way to relate them to ordinary tensor category with a map from super vector spaces to the Drinfeld center of that. So it's not so closely related, but it's a kind of, uh, you can relate those categories to more familiar objects. Uh, okay. okay. The, mm. Yeah. So, uh, so, uh, so I was talking about um, rep G, which is a super Tanakian category if G is an affine super group scheme. And uh, actually, the mo uh, a more general thing will be obtained if we fix an element of G, uh, you know, of the even, I mean, so G is a super uh, uh, group scheme, in particular, it has points over any super commutative ring, in particular over the ground field, which is just an ordinary group, sometimes called the even part. Uh, and, uh, uh, well, I mean, it's not, just even part, this is the reduced part. So it's a, a, just an ordinary group. And um, an element Z in there, which squares to one, and which uh, but conjugation by which is the parity automorphism of G. So in particular, it is a central element of this uh, group. And then we can look at uh, rep GZ, which is the representations of G on superspaces such that Z acts uh, 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 as the parity automorphism. So that's a slightly more general thing. And then this is, uh, this category is also super Tanakian uh, with a fiber functor, uh, just for getting the structure. Uh, and there is a theorem of Deligne, uh, which is an analog of the previous theorem, not much harder, is that if C is super Tanakian, then it is actually of this form. It is, uh, uh, rep GZ for some affine supergroup scheme G and the uh, element Z. More precisely, this G is just uh, the, again, the automorphism, uh, tensor, scheme of tensor automorphisms of F. You can define such a thing. And uh, Z uh, is the parity element. Uh, so because any, the functor f, because it goes to superspaces, it has the parity automorphism, which acts by one on even vectors and minus one on odd ones. So therefore, it uh, gives us an element of this group, and uh, that's the parity element. OK, so this is a pretty standard thing. And then there is actually a generalization, which is described by Deligne. Uh, so we looked at functors to super vector spaces, but we can actually consider uh, functors from C to another uh, symmetric tensor category D. Uh, and in this case, uh, uh, so if you have such a functor, uh, then you can describe C in terms of uh, Lie theory in D or group theory in D in the following way. So, uh, uh, so you can represent uh, C as a rep G comma pi, where G is an affine group scheme in this category D. And pi is the fundamental group of D. So let me elaborate what that actually means a little bit. So first of all, what is pi? Pi is the fundamental group of D. So it is uh, the scheme of tensor automorphisms of the identity functor. So this means that every symmetric tensor category actually has some canonical commutative Hopf algebra inside it. Uh, and uh, the, that is the algebra of functions on this group pi. So for example, for vector spaces, this group is trivial. And for super spaces, this group is Z mod two, which corresponds to this parity element that we mentioned. And this uh, affine group scheme, so this is a canonical affine group scheme sitting inside the category D. And it acts uh, in a canonical way on every object of D. So that's a kind of uh, its property. Uh, and it's called fundamental group because, for example, if D is the uh, category of uh, uh, locally constant sheaves on uh, some uh, uh, scheme or variety, then this group uh, pi will be the algebraic fundamental of growth in D. And so, uh, uh, so it acts canonically on every object of this D and also uh, if you have a functor like this from C, 
then this gives you a canonical homomorphism from pi to this group G, which is uh, the automorphisms, uh, tensor automorphisms of the functor F, uh, which is just composing. Uh, so if you have, uh, uh, you basically, uh, it's straightforward to construct this map. And, uh, and rep G pi is the category of representations of G on objects of D, which, whose restriction to pi is the canonical action. Well, I mean, this requires more uh, careful discussion, but it's not too important for our talk, so I'm going to go ahead. But the upshot is that C can be expressed in terms of group theory in D. So as soon as you have a functor from C to some category D that you understand better, let's say, you can always understand C better by saying that it's a category of representations of some group scheme in D. So, so it's a... Uh, with some compatibility condition with pi. So you express it in terms of group theory in T. Pavel, a question. May I have a question? Yes. Do you have this notion, a similar notion for non-symmetric functor, sense of factor? I mean that the category should not necessarily be symmetric. The braiding is not symmetric. Uh, well, if D is a braided category, then, uh, then you can, uh, yeah, you can define, uh, for example, when you have such a functor, you can define a certain Hopf algebra in D, such that C is going to be representation category of, or co-module category of this Hopf algebra. So you could uh, do something like that. But if D is not a braided category, then uh, I don't think so. Okay. Thank you. Well, I mean, you can always write something, but it will be kind of, it's, it's not going to be as nice as this. Okay, but I mean, like in, in last sentence, in other words, maybe you can express C in terms of a Hopf theory in D or something like that. Yes, yeah, so if D is and braided, and uh, uh, yeah, then, braided. then you can express it in terms of quantum group theory in D. Yeah. Quantum group theory, okay. Okay, okay and so, uh, so now uh, the question is, what are the pre tanakian categories which, uh, which cannot be expressed in terms of group theory in, uh, in the smaller or simpler categories? Um, well, that question is a little bit vague, so we will make it more precise in a second. But equivalently, this is the question, which pre tanakian category do not admit the exact tensor functor to smaller categories? Well, I didn't say what smaller means, uh, and so this is still vague. But uh, we can actually uh, make it precise in the following way. So uh, we can make uh, this notion of smaller uh, precise um, using the notion of surjective and injective tensor functor. So suppose we have an exact uh, tensor functor from uh, tensor category C to D. Then we will say that it is surjective if every object of D is a subquotient of the image of some object of C. So this doesn't mean that it's essentially surjective uh, in the sense of usual classical category theory. It's not required that every object of D is isomorphic to an object of the form f of x. It's only required that it's a subquotient of one. So in particular, an example of this would be restriction uh, functor uh, from a finite group to a subgroup, let's say. And uh, mm, uh, so if you have any tensor functor, it turns out that you can factorize it as a composition. So you can uh, define uh, a sub tensor subcategory of D, which is uh, called the image of F. And again, it is not the image in the sense of ordinary tensor categories, is uh, ordinary category theory, it is larger. Uh, 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 and namely, it is the category of all objects which occur uh, as subquotients uh, of objects of the form f of x. Uh, and uh, then uh, you can factorize this arrow as a composition of two arrows like that, where this second arrow is just an in inclusion of this subcategory, uh, which is called an injective functor, just fully faithful inclusion. And this functor is surjective in this above sense. And uh, uh, so smaller, so we will say that D is smaller than C if uh, we have a surjective functor from C to D, which is not an equivalence. Of course, this uh, uh, definition is deficient because it will turn out that there exist categories 
which admit such functors to themselves, so they're going to be smaller than themselves. Uh, but uh, for the purposes of this talk, we can use this uh, kind of lame terminology. So Pritanakian, but the important definition for us is the Pritanakian category is incompressible if we cannot map it to a smaller category. If any surjective tensor functor from C to another category D is an equivalence. Uh, so in other words, whenever you have such an arrow, this image is just going to be the same as C. So this map is going to be just an inclusion from C to D. So that's going to be the main definition, which is due to Austri. And uh, so equivalently, you say uh, that um, any, an incompressible category is one such that every uh, exact tensor functor from C to D is an embedded. Uh, and uh, uh, examples of such categories, vector spaces, because of course, you know, there is nothing smaller than vector spaces, so it is incompressible for trivial reasons, but also super vector spaces is incompressible uh, as a symmetric category for slightly less trivial reason, uh, namely because it doesn't have a functor to vector spaces, and that's the only thing that is actually smaller. I should mention that there is also a notion of incompressible categories for non-symmetric categories and even non-braided ones, but uh, it is uh, even less well understood. And there are many, many examples. So the nice thing about this theory is that among symmetric categories, there are actually very few incompressible categories. And that's uh, the subject of my talk. So what are, are there any other examples in vector spaces and super vectors? And actually, it's not so easy to construct such an example. Uh, so first of all, let's look at the case of characteristic zero. But before doing so, maybe there are any questions. Yeah, a, a stupid question. Uh, you say that maybe there are no more examples in uh, when the braiding is symmetric. And there are more examples if the braiding is not symmetric. That is uh, of incompressible categories? Yeah. Well, I mean, we will see that there are examples actually when braiding is symmetric, but very few. Okay, oh, yes, yes. No, but I when... Uh, when the, but it's, it's not, not symmetric. Has something to do with the order of the braiding or something like that? Yeah, yes. and in that case, there will be a lot of uh, braided categories which you cannot surjectively map into smaller, uh, let's say, braided categories or tensor categories just without braiding which you cannot map into smaller ones. So there are lots of those examples. So in principle, it's an interesting question, but, uh, but reviewing all incompressible braided categories will probably be quite hard. I mean, if you take a generic category, let's say fusion category and take its Drinfeld center, then we should not, should, then it's very likely going to be incompressible. So in that sense, this uh, principle that, uh, you know, uh, if you have a functor to a braided category, you can think of it as a quantum group in that category. It's not going to be very efficient because this bra basic braided categories where we will consider those quantum groups, there will be too many of them. But it, nevertheless, it's interesting to think about it, but I don't expect that the theory will be as successful as this one. Okay. All right, so let's uh, ask uh, if there are any more examples. So uh, let's first look at characteristic zero. Uh, and uh, in characteristic zero, uh, let's say that the category is sub-exponential or moderate growth if uh, for any object, the length of its tensor powers grows exponentially and not faster than that. Certainly exponential is the slowest you can expect. For example, if X has a realization in vector spaces, then you can take a, for a x, you can take just the vector space dimension. And there is a celebrated theorem of Deligne, and unlike the previous theorem, this theorem is quite difficult. And it says that if characteristic is zero and C is a pre Tanakian category of moderate growth, of sub exponential growth, then actually C is super Tanakian. So it is of the form as before, representations of a supergroup. And in particular, this means that at least among the categories of sub-exponential growth, vect and supervect are the only incompressible categories that exist. Now, 
it should be mentioned that there exist categories which are not of sub-exponential growth, and they are called Delin categories. They already were present in the paper of Delin and Milne, and then Delin wrote some other papers about them. These are obtained by uh, taking classical representation categories like rep GLN, rep SN, rep ON, and interpolating them uh, to non-integer values of uh, N. So I call it rep GLT, rep ST, and so on. And those have a faster growth. So the length of X to the N grows like square root of N factorial or something like that. Uh, but these categories, uh, so the theorem does not apply to them. Uh, but uh, all the examples, there, there are many other categories which you can build uh, by looking at various, you know, Hopf algebras inside these categories and taking representations, uh, co-modules. Uh, but what happens is such, such these categories aren't incompressible uh, because there are restriction functors like from st to st minus one. Uh, so actually, there is a conjecture, which uh, I don't know how to prove, but it seems uh, plausible, is that there are actually no incompressible categories in characteristic zero other than vector spaces and super vector spaces. Uh, now, in characteristic P, there actually are examples, and that's going to be the subject of my talk. Uh, and um, the simplest of those examples were constructed already in the 90s. So let me explain the construction. Uh, so first of all, I need to explain the notion of semi-simplification. So I'm going to consider a rigid symmetric monoidal category, maybe non-abelian, just Carubian, and call it T. And then uh, there is an important notion of negligible morphism. So a morphism from X to Y in this category is negligible if for any morphism the other direction, the trace of the composition is zero. So let me remind you that in a symmetric category, it's in particular has a spherical structure. So uh, any morphism has a trace. And uh, so this uh, is the condition of being negligible. And uh, it is easy to show that negligible morphisms form a tensor ideal in, uh, in this category, which we call N. Uh, namely, it is stable under composition with any morphism and also tensor product with any morphism. Uh, and uh, we can define a quotient by this ideal, which is called T bar. So it has the same objects as T, but morphisms home in T bar from X to Y uh, uh, is, uh, 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 home uh, over T from X to Y uh, mod N. Uh, so, so we kill uh, this ideal. Uh, and uh, so this is again going to be a rigid uh, symmetric monoidal category. And uh, uh, there is a theorem due to Uwe Janssen, which says that, uh, in fact, if uh, home spaces are finite dimensional, and any nilpotent endomorphism in T has trace zero, then this category is abelian and moreover semi-simple, and uh, its irreducible objects correspond to indecomposable objects in T of non-zero dimension. So, uh, you know, uh, it may sound surprising, but there do exist examples of categories T where nilpotent endomorphism may have non-zero trace, but uh, those are exotic uh, in the following uh, sense that uh, this, pro uh, 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 this property is satisfied in kind of all reasonable examples and it's easy to verify. The way uh, you verify it, you don't have to review all nilpotent endomorphisms and compute their trace. Uh, just if you know that there is some functor from T to uh, a symmet uh, to uh, abelian uh, symmetric category C, which is symmetric, uh, uh, then any nilpotent endomorphism of T uh, has uh, in T has trace zero, simply because uh, in an abelian category, uh, if you have a nilpotent endomorphism of an object, then uh, there is a filtration of this object by kernels 
of powers of this endomorphism. And uh, with respect to this filtration, uh, the morphism is strictly upper triangular, so its trace is zero. Its diagonal uh, part is zero, and therefore trace is zero. Uh, and um, in all examples that are of interest, this thing, uh, 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 such a functor exists. So now let us look at characteristic P, uh, which is positive. And um, uh, Sergei Gelfand and Kashdan, and also Georgiev and Mathieu in early 90s, uh, considered uh, the following construction. Uh, so uh, suppose you have a simple uh, algebraic group G connected, for example, SLN, and we look at tilting modules for this group. So uh, what are tilting modules? Uh, basically, uh, it means that you take fundamental modules and take their tensor products and uh, take direct summons uh, in there. So those will be in decomposable tilts. Uh, at least for SLN, that's how it works. And, uh, and then you can define the uh, semi, look at the semi simplification of this category uh, and uh, uh, T bar. So, uh, so the condition of uh, trace of nil point endomorphism is zero is satisfied here. So uh, we get a category which is semi simple. Uh, uh, and uh, it's called the Verlinde category, Ver G, uh, because actually it cate categorifies so called Verlinde algebra, which was introduced by the physicists. Uh, which arises in conformal field theory, best to mean a written model of conformal field theory. Uh, so, so it's growth and decreeing of this uh, category is the Berlin algebra if P is greater or equal than the Coxeter number of G. If P is less uh, than Coxeter number, then this category has a more interesting structure, which is not completely understood yet. But uh, for SLN, it is understood. And, uh, but in any case, even if P is greater than Coxeter number, you get um, finite, uh, finitely many simples, and uh, you know, get a nice uh, fusion category in characteristic P, which is symmetric. And um, already for SL2, you get something interesting. Uh, so uh, the simple objects are going to be irreducible representations of SL2, but starting from, uh, so we're going to label them by dimensions. So L1 is uh, trivial, L2 uh, up to LP minus one. And already start from P dimensional, they are, uh, lie in this negligible ideal, so uh, they, they get killed. Well, I mean, we have the same, uh, remember the semi-simplification construction, we have the same objects, but an object that was non-zero in the original category can become zero in the semi-simplified category if the identity morphism of this object is negligible. And that's what's going to happen for uh, tilting uh, modules with larger weight. Uh, so the only ones that remain are, are these. And uh, tensor product rule as for SL2, except that when you go uh, out of range, you have to uh, uh, just erase what you get. So if you get an LP, you have to uh, replace it with zero. And uh, so in particular, this means that LP minus one uh, squares to one, and uh, they both generate a category with two objects, which actually turns out to be super vector spaces for all odd primes. And uh, for p equal five, uh, there is something else uh, happening. So uh, if you take L3 and tensor it with itself, well, the usual SL2 tensor product rule says that this is one plus L3 plus L5, but L5 is zero here, so you have to throw it away and you get one plus L3. And that's called the Fibonacci category. Uh, well, basically because uh, if you, uh, this, this uh, rule implies that if you look at the uh, uh, tensor powers of L3, it will decompose into one and L3 and the coefficients are going to be Fibonacci numbers. And uh, so uh, this category ver2 uh, is just vector spaces, nothing new. Ver3 is just superspaces. There is, again, nothing new, just this thing. But already ver5 uh, 
has uh, super vector spaces, but it uh, has external tensor product with this Fibonacci category. So Fibonacci category is generated by L1 and L3, and uh, then uh, there is also L4 uh, and L2, which go in the other component. And um, in general, this ver p category is a tensor product of ver p plus with super vector spaces. Super vector spaces are generated by this L p minus one, uh, but uh, uh, ver p plus is the category which is spanned by L i with odd i. Okay, and uh, uh, another way to define this ver p without mentioning any uh, tilting modules and any group is just it also can be constructed as semi-simplification of the category of representations of the cyclic group, Z mod P, in characteristic P. And the fact is that this category is incompressible, uh, and so are the tensor categories VEC, super VEC, and ver P plus, which are subcategories of this thing. Well, I mean, it's easy to see, for example, that the category FIB is incompressible because, for example, it cannot map to vector spaces. Because if it did, then the dimension of the image of L3 due to this equation would have to satisfy the equation that d squared equals to 1 plus d. And uh, this equation uh, has solution 1 plus minus square root of 5 over 2. So there is no vector space with such dimension. And there is a theorem of Victor Ostrich, which is quite remarkable which says that uh, for any uh, Pretonakian uh, uh, category C, with semi, which is semi-simple with finitely many reducibles, which means it's a fusion category, there exists an exact tensor functor from C to uh, Verlin de P. And in particular, uh, the only incompressible Pretonakian fusion categories are Ver P and its tensor subcategories. Uh, and the conjecture is that uh, these are the only semi-simple incompressible pre tanakian categories. So, so even among the infinite categories uh, with infinitely many objects, these are the only ones, uh, at least in the case of sub-exponential growth. And I should mention that it is also not known whether there exists a semi-simple uh, category in characteristic P, uh, which is super exponential. That's not known. Uh, Okay, and so I will now start talking about non-semi-simple examples, but maybe we should make a break, which I promised before that, and uh, stop for questions. So any questions? So how long? If if you have a subcategory of an incompressible, a tensor subcategory of an incompressible, is it clear that it will be all incompressible? Uh, mm, it, it is not clear to me, no. But in all examples that we know, it is true. <laughs> Thanks. If you look at the semi-simplification of the representation of the C mod P square or P cube or something, do you obtain something new or is just uh, things are, uh, similar to Berlin categories? Yeah, no, they are all going to by Austrich theorem. They are all, all go, so if you take Z mod P uh, uh, square, so, or so if you take a cyclic group, then the category uh, that you get will be finite. So by Austrich theorem, it admits a functor to ver p. So you will get some affine group schemes in ver p. Uh, and these are related to Lie algebra OSP21. So, so basically, uh, you will get it's not a compressible cut. You can describe <laughs> what happens. Yeah, you don't get anything okay. particularly new. But uh, if you take a group, something like ZP cross ZP, but for p greater than two, this is already a wild representation type. So you get a huge category, and there it's not. Uh, so the conjecture that it is still going to have a functor to ver p, but we already don't have a proof of that. So it is not clear whether you get something new or not. 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? I, yeah, I have a related question. So suppose you have like this, uh, say, rep of C over P squared. And you say that you can, you will get some affine group scheme in bare P. Can you right. know explicitly this affine group scheme? Yeah, yeah, you can describe it. In this case, it is, uh, you have to take, it basically, you get something like uh, uh, OSP12 uh, inside Verlinde. So you take uh, like super group OSP12. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Okay, so should I continue? Yeah, please. Yeah. Yes, please. Okay. All right, so now I want to talk about the non semi simple case, which is basically uh, where the main results are. So uh, uh, if P equals to two, uh, uh, then it, it uh, so, so Venkatesh, uh, my former student, constructed uh, uh, an example uh, by modifying uh, commutativity constraint in rep Z mod 2. More precisely, it's uh, an additive version of Z mod 2, which is the Frobenius kernel of the additive group. It's a spectrum of the Hopf algebra K of X over X squared uh, in characteristic 2. And uh, so there is a triangular structure on that one given by some R matrix, one tensor one plus X tensor X, uh, which uh, gives you a category, which is a kind of super vector spaces and characteristic two, but non semi simple, uh, which is incompressible. So it is a new example, which is not semi simple. And in fact, uh, so Ostrich figured out a way to generalize it uh, slightly to a slightly larger category of Frobenius spiron dimension four. Uh, uh, and uh, that category already didn't come from a Hopf algebra because it had an object of the form square of dimension square root of two. But then um, uh, with Benson in 2018, we were able to construct an increasing sequence of pre category where C0 was just vector spaces, but C1 was this category B of Venkatesh and C2 was this category of Ostrich, uh, which is tilting modules of SL2 modular, uh, some tensor ideal, but it is a smaller tensor ideal. It is not all the negligible morphisms, but the next kind of tensor ideal. And this is, sits inside C3 and so on. Uh, and this uh, sequence was constructed uh, uh, by technique of Hopf algebras and categories and graded extensions. Uh, so they're all in characteristic two and they're all non-semi-simple starting from C1 and they're all incompressible. Uh, and uh, uh, we were uh, wondering what happens for general P. And uh, for this purpose, uh, I need to uh, recall. So it turns out that this can be generalized to general P. This is what, what we did in this paper. And uh, uh, to formulate the main result, I want to, uh, 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 say a few words about the tilting modules for SL2. So again, uh, what do they look like? So we have tautological two-dimensional representation. And then we take tensor powers of this representation and take indecomposable direct summons. And those are indecomposable tiltings. So the tiltings are all the direct sums such things. Uh, and they are labeled, indecomposable tiltings are labeled by uh, highest weight which is uh, uh, a non-negative integer. Uh, and uh, in particular, the, most, the important role is played by so-called Steinberg modules, uh, whose weight is a power of P minus one. So R Steinberg has highest weight P to the R minus one. And this is, as a representation, it is just the irreducible representation, which is simply action on the polynomials in two variables of degree p to the r minus one. So this turns out to be irreducible tilting uh, 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 and tilting at the same time. Uh, and uh, each of these modules has this property that if you tensor it with v and decompose, you can only get modules with larger or equal subscript. So it, it generates a, what is called a thick tensor ideal. 
which means a tensor ideal generated by objects. The morphisms there are just all the morphisms that factor through these objects. Uh, and so the objects that go, go into this ideal are all the t to the p to r minus one, which is this Arth Steinberg, and also all the higher ones. And um, so each thick tensor ideal like this gives a tensor ideal IR, which consists of morphisms that factor through these things. So in particular, we have the tensor ideal I0, which is basically everything, and then I1, which is the ideal of negligible morphisms, and then I2 is slightly smaller, I3 is yet smaller, and so on. And the theorem of Columbier says that actually any non-trivial tensor ideal for SL2 is one of these. This is a, um, only true for SL2. For higher rank groups, uh, there are a lot more ideals and they are not very well understood. But for SL2, we have this nice story. And so you can form quotients, TPR, which is tilting's modular IR. So if you mod out, out by I1, this is a semi-simplification, which is verb P. But if you mod out by IR for R greater than one, this is something new. Uh, and uh, so in general, this quotient, if R is greater than one, is not semi-simple, but also not abelian, except one case when R equals two and P equals two, which was considered by Ostrich, where by accident it happens to be abelian. But in general, it is not abelian. And the uh, examples of incompressible categories, the new examples of tensor categories that we got is obtained by constructing some sort of abelian envelopes of this. So, the key uh, uh, structure here is that this TPR contains a tensor ideal IR minus one over IR, which is the smallest ideal in here, and which is the quotient by IR of the previous, you know, one step larger one. And uh, so what we observed with Benson in 2018 in characteristic two, that the categories from our tower C2R <coughs> contain uh, this uh, tilting category module of the R tensor ideal in characteristic two. And this ideal uh, PR minus one, which, which I just defined, coincides with the subcategory of projective objects in this category. And so here is the main theorem. The main theorem says that there exists a unique pre Tanakian category ver P to the N. Uh, it's finite tensor category. And this uh, contains this TPN uh, as a subcategory, uh, as a full subcategory. And uh, this PN minus one, this ideal, uh, is the ideal of projective objects of this tensor category. And this category is incompressible. And uh, the first statement of this, the existence, the construction, was also proved independently by Kevin Coulombier by another method. So uh, in the remaining time, I want to describe the idea of proof and also um, the structure, what these categories look like. So uh, the idea of proof is uh, uh, using the notion of split morphisms and splitting objects. So a morphism between uh, two objects in an additive category is split if it is a direct sum of a, a zero morphism and an isomorphism. In other words, if it is a, a projection to a direct sum and followed by an inclusion of a direct sum. So X uh, if is A plus B and Y is A plus C and uh, A maps to itself by identity and B maps to C by Z. So for example, if X and Y are indecomposable, then the only split morphisms are uh, isomorphisms or zero morphisms. And also if you have a projective object, uh, in an uh, abelian tensor category and any morphism, then if you tensor uh, this morphism with identity of this P projective, then you get a split morphism. So, because, so, uh, so that's, a, that's an exercise. Basically because if you have any morphism, uh, well, let's say, so, so, so it has a kernel like a co-kernel, but after tensoring with P, those things will become projective and therefore they will split away. 
And then there is a notion of splitting ideals. So if you have a rigid symmetric monoidal category, which may not be abelian with finite dimensional home spaces, and you have a thick tensor ideal P, let's assume it is faithful, which means that if a morphism is killed by P, then it is zero to start with. So we will say that this is a splitting ideal if every morphism is split by uh, tensoring uh, with identity morphism of every object of P. So this ideal splits morphisms. And then the general construction is that if you have such a splitting ideal, uh, then you can actually construct an abelian tensor category C containing T such that P is the subcategory of projective objects. And, and the construction is, is very simple. You just look at complexes, like how would you reconstruct a category from its projective objects? You just look at complexes which are infinite in the negative direction only. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and these complexes, uh, so there is a subcategory of resolutions, and, and those are going to you know, reconstruct your category. So there is a few things that you have to check, but this works and it gives you this category C. For example, you need to construct the unit object, so this requires some work, but it can be done. Also, you have to prove that the category you get is rigid. This can also be done. And now the application to our setting. Remember, we had this category TPN, which is the quotient uh, of uh, tiltings by the nth tensor ideal. And uh, we had this ideal PN minus one, which is N minus one tensor ideal modulo of the nth tensor ideal. And uh, uh, so this, idea, this key lemma is that this is a splitting ideal. And that's very good because we can now apply this construction. So we actually want to see more examples of splitting tensor ideals. They are actually hard to come by because when we have such an ideal, we can run this construction and get something really interesting. And so, so that's uh, basically how the construction goes of these categories. And uh, now I want to finish by uh, discussing some properties of these categories. So first of all, uh, so we have object Ti in these categories, which are labeled from zero to P to the N minus one minus one, but the projectives are only those Ti, which are from degree P to the N minus one minus one to P to the N minus one, not including P to the N minus one. And uh, it's convenient to shift that by one, so replace I by I plus one, then these will be exactly the numbers that have exactly n digits in base p expansion, which means that the first digit is not zero. And, uh, uh, and then uh, you can try to ask for a Cartan matrix of this category, which is uh, the dimension of home between the projectives. And that uh, actually can be computed in the tilting category because it turns out that uh, nothing gets killed uh, here. And, um, uh, then there is a nice combinatorial game that you can play, which is called the negative digits game. So uh, this is a sum like, uh, you know, this five plus four P plus zero P squared plus three P cubed plus two P to the fourth. Uh, but what you can do is you can change the sign of the digits. So let's change the signs of some digits, except the first one we are not allowed to change, but the others we are allowed to change. So for example, here we get such sum, and uh, any number that you can get in this way is called the descendant of i. Uh, so for example, this number has eight descendants because you can change the sign of all digits except for zero. Well, two, you're not allowed, and zero, you are allowed, but it doesn't change anything. So you get eight descendants. And then from a work of Tubenhauer and Bedrich, Bedrich, it follows that the Cartan matrix Cij is just the number of common descendants of i and j. So, for, and a couple of exercises about it. First of all, Cij is either zero or a power of two always. And secondly, the determinant of the Cartan matrix is a power of p. Uh, 
So this is analogous to the representation theory of finite groups in characteristic P. Also, an important feature of these categories is that we have a chain of embeddings similar to this tower that we constructed with Benson. So ver P, which is the most basic category, which was known before, embeds into this category ver P squared, which is already new, and this category ver P cubed and so on. All of these are non-semi-simple starting from the second one. And um, also, each of them contains a copy of super vector spaces for P greater than two. And um, so if you take this more objects with even subscripts, this corresponds to the category ver plus P to the N. And uh, the whole category is a tensor product. Now, what do they categorify? So the positive part categorifies this remarkable ring, which is the real part of the cycloatomic ring generated by P to the nth root of unity. Uh, for P equal to, you get something similar, but slightly different. So uh, I'm not going to say. Uh, also, you can construct, um, uh, classify simple objects. So in finite, uh, in, in representations of uh, uh, algebraic groups and characteristic P, the classification of simple objects is pretty simple. You just, it's uh, given by uh, Steinberg tensor product theorem. And there is a similar uh, theorem here, uh, namely those embeddings that we have here give rise to uh, some simple objects that you can uh, uh, construct. Uh, so, you know, this category inherits some simple objects from the previous ones. So, uh, so we have, uh, in particular, uh, from verb P, uh, so, so there are some simple objects which are just T's with subscripts up to P minus one, and I'm gonna call them T-I-N in verb P to the N. And then there are similar objects that I inherited from verb P N minus one, and from verb P N minus two, and so on. And the tensor product theorem says that any simple is just a tensor product of such things uh, uh, in a unique way. So it's a complete list and the number of uh, simples uh, is therefore, uh, uh, so it's, uh, uh, so, so the only uh, exception is uh, verb P, it has P minus one objects and there are P of these and P of these, so you get P minus one times P to the N minus one. And also projective covers of them are a P sub S, where S is related to I in this way, just some manipulation of the digits. You can describe uh, uh, X between simple objects. Uh, I'm not gonna discuss it in too much detail. Uh, but you can precisely describe all the X groups. Uh, you can describe the blocks of these categories. They have these sizes here. Uh, uh, an important thing is that you, this category admits a lift to characteristic zero, and uh, that lift is a semi-simple braided category, which was constructed by the physicists already. This is the uh, semi-simplification of the quantum group category at root of unity of order P to the N for SL2. And that's uh, important because this implies uh, that the Cartan matrix is uh, positive definite and it is in fact of the form D times D transposed where D is the decomposition matrix. So you take a simple object in characteristic zero, reduce it to characteristic P and look at how, how it splits. Now, uh, actually these categories answer a basic question about tensor categories. So suppose you have a tensor category generated by an object whose second exterior power is the trivial object one. So we can now classify all such categories. Uh, so generated means that if you take tensor powers of uh, this object and uh, its duals and uh, take direct summons, you get your category. So these are the only, ca the, the following categories. So first of all, it's, if you have a finite subgroup of SL2, in your over your field, uh, then you can take representations of that, and uh, it has this tautological representation X, which has this property. Now there are these categories for P to the N, which are new, 
And there is a kind of trivial example. If you take super vector spaces and you have x is a, uh, the odd simple object, p not equal to two and three, it also has this property. So this is the full classification. So uh, you can kind of describe their semi-simplification to some extent. I'm going to skip that because it's kind of technical. And the last slide is uh, some open questions. So still, we don't know things. So what are module categories? What are exact module categories over this category? We don't know. We suspect that there are very few, possibly just uh, this category itself uh, uh, in decomposable exact module category. Uh, but it's not proof. What is cohomology? So x from one to one in this category. So that's very interesting. There is a conjecture and a partial proof in our joint work with Dave Benson, which is uh, still unfinished, but close to completion. And uh, also you can consider a union of these categories because they embedded into each other. And uh, uh, so all the tensor subcategories there are just uh, verb p to the n and verb p to the n plus super vec. The question is, are there any other incompressible categories and characteristic? We don't know. And finally, uh, is there an analog of Deline theorem in characteristic p? So if you have a pre tanakian category of sub-exponential growth, is there a, a, a fiber functor to this category verb p infinity? I mean, we cannot do it with anything simpler than ver p infinity because of this incompressible, but uh, hopefully there is a fiber functor to this ver p infinity. And if the category is finite, then there is a fiber functor in one of those categories. If we could prove that, that would be really great because this would mean that we have a very concrete understanding of uh, symmetric uh, tensor categories in characteristic. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions? Yes, I have a question. Um, at the beginning, when you talked about uh, how to describe pretanakian categories with uh, some kind of fiber factor, fiber factor to an uh, incompressible category, for example, in the case of vector space and super vector spaces, you could describe essentially those categories as co-modulus theories over Hopf algebra, over commutative or super commutative Hopf algebras. That's right, yeah. So, yes, but in the case of Berlin categories in characteristic P, is there some kind of description of what kind of Hopf algebras in positive characteristics I have to see to get some kind of fiber factor to the Berlin categories? Ah, that's a very interesting question. So uh, basically your question is, uh, what does the Lee theory in, in, inside Berlin the category looks like? Yes. And uh, right. this is a very interesting question that is largely open. Uh, some uh, work was done by my uh, former student, Sidhar Venkatesh, whose thesis was, uh, uh, you know, he started to develop Lee theory in Berlin the category. In particular, he showed that uh, the, uh, so Masuoka described the supergroups uh, uh, um, as uh, basically Harishandra pairs of an uh, ordinary group scheme and uh, uh, some uh, Lie superalgebra such that uh, the Lie algebra of this ordinary group scheme embeds as the even part of the corresponding Lie superalgebra. And so what Venkatesh did is he generalized that to Berlin the category. Uh, so, so this is, this gives us a kind of very concrete tool to study. So, so a fine group schemes in Berlin the category means that you have just an ordinary uh, group scheme and also a Lie super algebra. Uh, uh, sorry, a Lie algebra in Berlin the category together with the identification of the Lie algebra of this ordinary uh, group with the uh, kind of degree zero part of this uh, Lie algebra in Berlin the category. But now what Lie algebras in Berlin, the category look like, uh, we don't know very much about. So uh, for example, what are simple Lie algebras? Uh, there are many interesting examples. There is a construction, uh, which is reduction from uh, uh, 
So if you have a Lie algebra, for example, ordinary Lie algebra with an automorphism of order P uh, in characteristic P, then uh, this Lie algebra is an object in rep Z mod P, and you can uh, take its semi simplification and it will be a Lie algebra in verb P. Uh, okay. So it would be it's like uh, P, grade, P graded Lie algebra or something like that. Yeah, yeah, but it is not graded because it's a Z P in characteristic P. So ah, there are okay. many examples like that. And we, there, are, there is also, if you have a derivation whose P, P power is zero, you can do a similar thing. And uh, so we don't know, uh, for example, it would be extremely interesting to have some even conjecture about classification of simple Lie algebras, even for large enough P in, uh, in this category, or simple groups. Uh, and uh, okay, so there are some uh, uh, things, like for example, you can define G the analog of GLN and GLNM, if you have any object of Verlinde category, which is, uh, you know, N1 L1 plus N2 L2 plus so on plus NP minus one LP minus one, uh, then you have GL, GL of this object, which would be a group scheme depending on P minus one integers N1 through NP minus one. What does representation theory of that look like? All these questions are, most of them are open and, uh, we have pro made progress on some of that, but that's basically one of the main directions where I and uh, my students want to uh, uh, go from this point. And uh, certainly there will be even more interesting questions of the same sort in Verlin the P to the N where N is greater than one, but, uh, mm -hmm. but that will be even more complicated. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, just Berlin and P, it's... it's... No, just constructing the algebra and playing with them is already interesting. This is a, this, I think it will be a really interesting and very rich direction in the next uh, few years. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? So can this uh, verb P to the N be semi-simplified? Yeah, so if we take semi-simplification of this category, uh, well, I mean, already uh, for verb P squared, maybe, maybe I should uh, uh, show this slide, uh, which I kind of skipped. Uh, uh, so, uh, if you take verb P squared, uh, then this category has finite representation type. And uh, so semi-simplification will be a finite category which can be described explicitly. And it looks like this. Verlinde P cross Verlinde P cross rep of Z mod 2P minus 2 comma Z, where Z is the element of order 2 in this group, and so you take the product of those three things and then there is a rep Z mod two sitting diagonally here. So there is a super line here, super line here, and a, a, a object of order two here. And that product of those generates a rep Z mod two. So we can do D equivariantization. And so, uh, so this part uh, is exactly the span of all the simple objects of verb P squared, which become simple objects in, uh, in the same simplification. And actually that's also true for larger N. So it contains, the same simplification here contains tensor power of verb P. But uh, starting from N equal three, this category has wild representation type. So it's going to be a huge category and uh, we don't know much about its structure. But even for simpler things like rep Z3 cross Z3 in characteristic three, we don't understand the semi-simplification at all. So it's too early to ask this question in some sense. Okay, okay. Once you have wild representation type, we don't know what you can find inside. It's really a fascinating question. Uh, 
which is very, we know very little about. So any other question? Okay, maybe we should thank public and